the MMA Discussion Podcast, episode number seven. My name is Nick, as you all know. And finally, we have our very first guest on the podcast today, Ulysses Useless Gomez. What's up? Say what's up. Hey, man, how you guys doing? Um, first of all, I got to say thank you for coming on. This is a real pleasure. I appreciate having you on with us uh, for our page. I know you're a fan of the page, and we appreciate that. No, anytime, man. So, but just basically, we just shoot the shit on this one. There's not really any topics going around other than uh, what we've put on the page. Um, what I hear that you're doing a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu tournament. Why don't you give us a plug-in on that? Yeah, it's the, um, the Eddie Bravo Invitational. But uh, no geek, so I guess it's submission grappling. Um, submission only, a 10-minute time limit, and then there's some overtimes. But uh, no points, so should be fun. Submission only, there's no time limit, or is there a time limit? Um, there's a 10-minute time limit. There's a 10... 10- Ten minute time limit, and then there's a uh, three minute overtimes. I think there's three three minute overtimes. I don't know. <laughs> I don't plan. I don't plan to go the whole ten minutes. Yeah, good to get that shit done as quick as you can. I've done a few t- jujitsu tournaments myself. Our admin Adam also uh, partakes in those quite often. Um, yeah, they're fun. Yeah. What belt are you? I uh, in jujitsu brown belt. Ah, right above me, I'm a purple belt. Oh. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'll get my brown belt this year. That's the goal. I've I've been a purple yeah. belt since 2012, so. Okay, I've been a brown belt for like uh, what? Two years, maybe three. I don't know. Who do you train under? Uh, I'm used to train under Mark Lampin, uh, but now that he left to work with the Team Takedown guys, it's uh, Simpson Go. Mark Lampin, that dude knows his shit. Uh, yeah, it depends who you ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been a big fan of his for a while. Uh, I met yeah, him once. At, yeah, I met him once at, at a fight at a UFC event. He was just walking around, and I recognized him. Uh, I was at uh, UFC Fox Four when the UFC came to uh, LA. In yeah, Anaheim. Yeah. Yeah, I fought on that one. Um, yeah. Did you introduce yourself to Mark? I did. I said hi. He said what's up. I said you're Mark Lehman, right? And he's like, yeah. And I asked if I could get a picture. He was all cool with it. Seemed like a cool he's, dude. He's um the only guy that like. If someone comes to the gym, he'll be like, wait, wait, I met you in 2007 at this tournament, you're, and you don't remember the person's name. That's weird. Yeah, he's like cool. really uh, interesting. <laughs> That's funny. So um, I also wanted to ask you, because I'm curious myself, I know you had a fight lined up, uh, I believe it was, was it Titan FC? Uh, Cage Warriors, that Cage one? Warriors, yeah. And uh, you had a you had a problem with the the weight the weight cut and you weren't mm-hmm. able to fight. Uh, hopefully you're feeling better. Um, but what happened there? Yeah, um, I got there. I think we I, I flew in on Sunday, which got there Monday. And I think when I fought in London before that, I flew in Friday, got there Saturday, something weird like that. But uh, basically, like um, I retained a lot of water from the flight, and I always have a, I always cut the same exact way where like. Mm-hmm. Whatever I wake up that day, I'll drink two gallons of water, I'll obviously eat, then I try to go to sleep at whatever what I woke up at. And uh, for whatever reason, like when I would go to sleep, I wouldn't sleep. I'd probably sleep for like an hour, maybe an hour and a half. And then so, so I wouldn't sleep off what I would normally do. So next day I would always, so same exact thing, eat the same exact food. So it was always like, whatever I would wake up at, I would try to go to sleep at, and I wouldn't float anything. And finally I got to like the day of the wanes, I was like 10 pounds over, which is good amount for some of my size i'm normally ideally six pounds i've done 12 which i don't like but and uh so instead of doing the um the bath like i normally do i decided to do the sauna just to get as much weight off as possible because i was kind of stressing about it and then after we got done doing the sauna um my coach wanted me to walk on the treadmill to keep the sweat going while we ran a bath and then i don't remember much after that oh wow yeah scary did you just wake up at a hospital or no, I woke up on the floor. Then I mean, Damn. I, uh, I was. I woke up and I felt fine. Well, the weird thing is, like, they gave me water and like my whole body just started like shaking uncontrollably. Um, I don't know if it was shock or whatever, but um, then we went to the hospital just for precautions. And then uh, Graham, the guy that ran the show, says he didn't feel comfortable with me uh, competing um, after I did that, which makes sense. Yeah, which is fair. It's actually kind of him making sure that you know putting your safety yeah. ahead of everything. Uh, that sucked to hear, because everybody, uh, especially on the page, was excited to uh, watch you fight. Um, yeah, then... and I really want to be the, the guy, too. <laughs> you talking shit? Yeah, he's, uh, he was nice the whole time until after this. Then, 
after we had that incident, he wasn't so nice, and we exchanged words a couple times. And oh. We'll see each other eventually. Yeah. Uh, so what's up with your MMA career? You haven't fought since February uh, after uh, the UFC on Fuel TV fight card. Um, you getting back into MMA anytime soon? Yeah, I like to know. I haven't fought over a year. That was supposed to fight next week, May 10th. Then the show that I was supposed to fight for got canceled. Oh. So, uh, so that's been a steady problem then now. Been a string of bad luck there? Yeah, yeah. I'm always the one, but you know. Have you met Eddie Bravo? Yeah, a couple of times. Is he a cool dude? Um, he's always, I mean, I never had a problem with him. He's always been nice to me. I've, I've, uh, I'm a big fan of the rubber guard and I've done, I've, uh, I've got, I thought you were going to say smoking weed. And I, <laughs> I, uh, I like buying, I bought a couple of his instructional videos and practiced it in the gym every now and again. It's fun. I really enjoy it. Especially when you're, uh, I've been stretching since I was like seven years old doing kickboxing. So I was set for it. It's fun. It's really fun. Uh, and I enjoy, uh. Uh, his style of grappling very well. Did you happen to see his uh, his uh, match ben against? Morris? Yeah. No, I was. Uh, I didn't see it, and then I wanted to to watch it on YouTube, mm -hmm. and then I was hearing the Joe Rogan podcast, and he said, "Don't watch it, pay for it." This, this, and that. So I was like, "All right, I'll like, I'm not gonna watch YouTube. I'll pay for the stream." But I just been so busy with training for the for the Eddie Bravo thing that I had to just come around around to do it. Yeah. It was it was a, it was an exciting match, but but if, I'm sure you've if you've asked anybody around, it, it did seem like uh, Eddie had control of that fight for the majority yeah, of the match. I mean, that. It, it was fun to watch, though. I mean, I mean, props goes to both competitors for sure. I, I enjoyed it. I thought, I thought the event in whole was was also very entertaining. Um, the rule set of it being a draw, if you, if it goes to a time limit, was kind of odd to me, just because you know there's a certain weird feeling when you're watching a match and you're expecting a winner, and it just goes to a decision and it's a draw. You know right. I mean? um, but overall, I thought it did great, and, I, and I'm a fan of Metamora, so it's it's nice watching. And it's good. It was good to see Eddie get out there and compete himself. It's very fun. He's he's a wizard on the ground. Yeah, I wanted to see the Vinny Magalesh and uh, Keenan match, but I guess Vinny got a uh, pet staff or something. Yeah, he had staff and had to pull out of that. I remember yeah. recording that one up. You down to answer some fan questions? Yeah, yeah, yeah we'll see what you guys got. Yeah. Well, first, the first one, obvious one, fans want to know where you got your nickname. I know you've told me. Uh, but I'm actually... uh, so there was this girl in, in school, well, probably like middle school. Um, you know, everybody gets gets nicknames when you're in high school. If you if you like the nickname, it doesn't stick. If you hate it, it sticks. You know. Yeah. And I remember one time she was trying to say my name Ulysses, and she said useless, and then she thought it was the funniest thing. <laughs> yeah. So of course I hated it. So that's what everybody called me in high school, middle school, then high school. And then when I got out, got out of high school, I started training uh -huh. with Mark Lehman, and uh, he was just like, "Well, they, does he have a nickname?" And I was like, "Well, everybody calls me useless." So he thought it was the funniest thing. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. Just stuck. Yeah, I mean, with a name like Ulysses, you don't really need a nickname, but whatever. One one fan on your uh, Facebook page asks, "What's the what's the what's your favorite and uh, song you've ever walked out to a fight with?" Um. Well, this one you should ask that. <laughs> I used to like the song, the baby song by Justin Bieber. <laughs> oh, really? Well, Dad, there's a funny story behind it. I like it. I hate it. I hate it because the last time I walked out to it, I got knocked out. Uh, the only time I've ever been. You walked tried. out to that and then got knocked out. When did you yeah, walk out to that? The UFC on Fox. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the only time I ever out. Wow. But, but before that, I, you, I, uh, when I fought for the Tachi Palace for 125, mm -hmm. I fought this guy named Luis Gonzalez and... We were arguing about who was going to come out first. I go, well, you come out first. He's like, no. So he, <laughs> we made the bet. Like, he didn't think I was going to make weight. So I was like, look, man, I was like, as soon as I go, when I make weight, I, you're going to walk out first. And if I miss weight, I walk out first. He's like, all right. So, of course, I made weight by, like, a pound. So uh, he walked out first. And he walks out. It's like, uh, it, we would fall, like, right around single to mile. So he mm -hmm. walks out with a sombrero and some Mexican song. And hopefully, you know, plays. He, like, he's from that area. So they loved him. <laughs> and then after he gets walked out, the whole place goes black, and every, and like my name comes on the screen, so everybody starts booing. Yeah. <laughs> and then the the the, the beginning that be, the baby song comes on, and all the girls in the crowd just start going crazy. <laughs> like, oh, hey, this might actually work. <laughs> that's what I like, but that's also why I hate it because the, the more I go fight, gets the ladies all get the all the all the ladies and the preteens watching the fight get your back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's hilarious. That's a funny story. Yeah. Another one asks, 
Uh, when is what has been your favorite uh, moment as far as being an MMA fighter, uh, and what and what was your biggest takeaway as thus far as a fighter? Um, my favorite moment probably was the same exact fight where I fought Lewis. We fought for the belt, and I remember it was a five round fight, and I I won four out of the five rounds easily. And um, you know the, you know you're always worried when they announce the decision. You're like, well, I, I'm pretty sure I got it, but you never know. It announced me the winner, and like everybody was all happy. They were yelling, and I was just like, "Ah, is that it? Like, I thought it'd be bit better, you know." Mm -hmm. So I was kind of let down in that regard. But then my mom walks in, and she puts the belt on. She's all smiling, so I was like, "All right, it was worth it." <laughs> yeah. And uh, the biggest takeaway, as far as a fighter, is um, when you sign on that dotted line and you walk into the cage, mm -hmm. whether you're hurt or you're prepared. It doesn't matter. There's no asterisk next to your record. There's fights where I should have lost that I won. There's fights where I should have won that I lost. But there's no asterisk. So I tell people, I go, look, man. I go, when you walk in there, you're not hurt. You're 100%. I go, because if you win, if you lose, it's not an asterisk next to your record. But you took the fight on short notice or you did this, this, and that, you know? Mm -hmm. so that's one of the big takeaways uh, as far as the big that took. Yeah, Drill Rios asked. That's a cool story, though. I, I like that second part of the takeaway. It's 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 definitely. I've well, I fought four times, and my biggest takeaway from each one is you you, you can't ever. Um, after the fight, you got to look at what you did and always feel. It's like a certain like because I've never felt excited for any fight, even though I love doing it in the moment. But I've never felt excited. I get like a nervousness to where I want to get sick. You know what I mean? But afterwards, you got to feel. Um, a sense of accomplishment just getting in there but at the same time you always got to look and be it, it, you gotta have a certain expectation of yourself and uh, um, and I feel like that's where you're kind of at it's funny that you say that because like all right, I grew up playing soccer mm -hmm. and my brother he's a pretty good soccer player and um, before one of his games we, uh, he it's when he played for the, the Colorado Rapids right we went to his game in Colorado and when I played soccer, I was never nervous. I would just play. Just I pretty much just wanted to hang out with my friends. Mm -hmm. I mean, I played from you know eight years old to probably about fifteen, sixteen. It was always fun to me. It was never. Um, uh oh, daddy, what's up, daddy, dude? Daddy. Yeah. <laughs> Here, what's up? This is my son. I, I was, I was playing. Say hi. That is a magnificent set of hair. Neil, go downstairs to play with Jaden. I'm on. No. Yeah. No. Come on. <laughs> so, um. <laughs> sorry, he's playing with the nephews. No worries, man. Yeah, take him downstairs. Funny. Take him downstairs with Grandma. Jaden, go downstairs, buddy. Hang on a second. No worries, bro. Fans who can't see, his son has probably the best looking hair I've ever seen. Sorry, right, guys. No worries, man. Um, he's uh, yeah. So my brother, so he played, he played, he played professional soccer, and uh, we went to one of his games. And when I used to play, I would never get nervous. I would just go to just hang out with my friends. Mm-hmm. And when I started doing jiu-jitsu and I started competing, I could kind of like, there's certain things that I do before a match or a competition to get myself ready. And I can see like, I, just from me being, a, you know, competing for, I've had like over 100 jiu-jitsu jiu matches and a whole bunch of other stuff. So I know like how to, how how long it takes me to get in the zone and what I got to do to get there. Mm -hmm. When we went to my brother's game, it was the day of his game, and I could see like as the game got closer, he his trigger would kind of switch. And he does the same exact things that I do, but it's funny because I never was nervous when I did when I did soccer. Yeah, I think it was just always fun to me. So you you mentioned you know that earlier, like going out there, and that's why how I knew like jiu jitsu, jitsu was my sport because it makes me nervous. Same thing with fighting. Soccer was never something that I was gonna take competitively. It was just more just to have fun, you know. Exactly. That's a, yeah. I mean, one of one of my favorite things about fighting is afterwards. Uh, like you just you're you're having you have such a rush afterwards even though it's like a, it's like a feel of a after rush of fighting but I get like a sense of relief at the same time so I'm excited with no matter how I did and uh, what is it I have 
four fights and I'm three and one and my one loss even afterwards. Uh, I was mad just because the guy, you know, sometimes when you get lo- when you lose to that one dickhead, you know what I mean? They're cocky. I lost a couple. Yeah, to, to those cocky assholes. That was suck, but. I mean, there's just something fun about it at the same time, uh, uh, but I, I am competitive, and uh, it's fun. It's awesome. The worst thing about about this sport, well, there's a couple of things, but one of them is, like, you can train six weeks, eight weeks, and you can be perfect those six to eight weeks. All that matters is those 15 to 25 minutes. And on the flip side, you could be terrible your six to eight weeks, but if you know how to put it together, you know, that 20, that 25-minute time sprint or 50 minutes, mm-hmm. you're the man, you know? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> Dave Gutierrez asks, uh, or no, no, Lenny Marcado, one of my favorite fans of the page, he asks, how long do you think it will be till you get back in the UFC, and do you, uh, uh, and he obviously asked when's the next time he's planning on fighting, but I already asked that, so. Um, ideally, in the perfect world, I would like to fight in the UFC on that Mexico card they have, no more, I would like to fight in the UFC on that Mexico card they have, no more, 15th. Yeah. Um, awesome. I want to, I'm s- I'm in, I'm talking right now with the show to fight in July. Hopefully, mm-hmm. they can get that one, win that one, maybe fight again in uh in August or September, and then that's two in a row, and hopefully get the UFC. It helps that my brother plays soccer in Mexico, so he could I have a little bit of follow because of him. But um, you know, we'll see. And then uh, another fan asks, "What do you think of the Ultimate Fighter uh, Latin America?" And he asked, and I was going to ask anyway, uh, if you were planning on auditioning for that. Um, well, I guess they start filming May 12th, so I'm pretty sure they already yeah. got what they need as yeah. far as auditioning, because it takes, like, uh, at least a month of background checks. Yeah, exactly. I but, was uh, Sean Shelby, man, if you need someone, hit me up. <laughs> yes. Sean Shelby's a cool dude. I met him, at, of all places, at, in Los Angeles at a, uh, at a coffee house. It was the funniest thing. Like, I didn't he recognize him at first. Huge 49ers fan. Is he? That's yeah, funny. man, Patriots. Well, that's just because he hangs around Dana White. <laughs> yeah, he's a cool guy. Um, he used to train with our gym. Really? Yeah, he used to train at Cobra Kai. Wow. Cobra Kai yeah. Jiu-Jitsu. Yep. <laughs> what do you think about the UFC's flyweight division? And what is your uh, and who do you think will be the guy that dethrones DJ? Um, well, I think the, the, the guy that's going to dethrone DJ will be probably himself. You know, I think that uh, it's either he's going to make a mistake, you know, or he's not going to come prepare like he should. Uh, I don't think the Ali guy is going to beat him. And uh, I think Benavides can beat him, but it's just so hard if you're, if he already beat you twice, you know? Yeah, to get back to that title. Right. Yeah. Um, and, any, and anybody can get caught, you know, um, on any given night. You know, you got two guys that weigh 125 pounds of four ounce gloves. It's the potential to be a bad mass for one of those guys. But, um,. It's hard to bet against DJ. As far as how I feel about the the, the flyweight division, I mean, I've had I fought four guys, three guys in the top ten in the world, and um, I'm outside looking at. You get some guys who are in the UFC, then I'm like, who is this guy? You know, they haven't, they don't have the credentials that I have or that some of the other fighters have, and they're in there, you know, and you know they're one and zero or two and zero in the UFC, and I'm over here zero and two, you know. You know, it could be bad luck, could be, you know, just not the right right time, right, wrong place kind of thing, you know, but who knows. I remember that last fight of yours, the one against Phil Harrison, uh, England, and I was just, like, so upset with that one. I really thought you had that one. Uh, I, I can't remember the exact fight. I just remember thinking that you had that win. I even messaged you. I was, I was surprised that it was a decision. You was even more surprised that they had, uh, that they had decided to release you. Um, yeah, um, I mean, with that fight, you know, like everybody that you asked, Says that I won the first round hands down, mm-hmm. and every round I won, but you could kind of see it getting into him, but not really. And every says he won the third round. Well, none of the judges gave me the first round. If that's the round that every says that I won, but none of the judges gave yeah. it to me. Mm-hmm. And, every, and all the judges said he won the third round, but the judges gave me the third round. So it's like, well, what are we doing? You know? Yeah, I mean, you, you don't. I mean, I never say anything bad about. Uh, like, I never believed in them. Uh, the the conspiracy of hometown judging, but that seemed like it anyway. Uh-huh. You know what I mean? Because if I'm not mistaken, Phil Harris is from uh, London, England, or England. I mean, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I was so disappointed with that decision, even more so in the decision to let you go afterwards, especially from especially from what looked like such a close fight. Uh, at least my, my no, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead, bro. 
I mean, that was kind of my own, my own fault, you know. Um, I'd never been, like, stopped in fight. Then after John Moraga stopped me, I felt like I had to prove to myself that I had a good chance. So I was like, all right, I was like, I'm going to keep on the feet no matter what happens. And I'm keeping the fire on the feet. And I'm actually, I think I'm out kickboxing Phil. I could have probably easily took him down and submitted him. I mean, that green-haired guy, Louis Gondit, did. And he's nowhere near the rapper than I am. Mm-hmm. You know, but I decided to, you know, to probably the wrong time to prove to myself that I still had a chin, you know, and uh, probably the wrong strategy, but let me learn, you know. Yeah. I mean, uh, like looking at, I mean, look, I remember when I first heard about you, I looked at your record and I was like, man, this guy had been tapping dudes left and right. Because if I'm not, you had like six or seven submissions or something like that going into the, the, the uh, John Moraga fight. And, um, yeah. And I was looking at that fight, I was like, hmm. Sketch. I I had you picked, and uh, but that's only because I think that was John Moraga's first fight as well, and uh, his his record was so and so to me. But um, but I remember uh, uh, reading that. I believe that, and now I look at your jujitsu credentials. It looks insane. Like you've been in, and, and now you're telling me you've been in a hundred jujitsu matches. That's f- fucking insane. <laughs> I've only yeah. Done, like, the thing with John is like they call you, you know, and you. I was. I probably shouldn't. I wasn't in shape for the fight, you know. Um, I probably had like maybe maybe a week and a half to train for it, but when they call you, you really can't say no, you know. Yeah. And uh, I think if I would, granted, like okay, he knocked me out, he beat me, no questions asked. Um, I think if you know the first couple times you start sparring again, everything hurts. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't spar when I'm not when I have a fight coming up. I like to save my brain cells, so I only spar when I'm training for a fight. Other than that, I just grapple and hit mitts and all that. Mm-hmm. Well, I had two two days of sparring for that fight, and you know my third day of sparring was actually the fight. So um, <laughs> everything hurts, you know. And uh, I think if I was in shape and you know been sparring you know consistently, uh, it wouldn't have been a problem. But then again, you know it's hard for me to say that when I got knocked out. Yeah, is that how you train more, more often? At least back in the day, like in the Tachi Pals days, you were more of a, a, a grap. Obviously, you were more of a grappling based fighter. But did you ever? train with anybody specifically for your striking or you were just doing the, the basic gist of sparring and pads? Well, um, like as far as like striking, I would train with uh, Ken Hahn. He was one of the coaches for the Ultimate Fighter um, when it was um, Frank Muir. I trained with Gil Martinez, um, who was the boxing coach for Couture. He used to be the boxing coach for Shim Couture and all them. Oh, dope. But now I just work with, I just work with Gil uh, strictly. I don't work with Ken anymore. And I've sparred. I mean, like one of my main sparring partners was uh, Wayne McCullough. And I don't know if you're familiar with boxing, but he won a silver medal in the in the Olympics. Oh wow! Man, <laughs> yeah. So I mean, and he so I can't put a wide search, so it's kind of like, you know, it happens, whatever. Well, I mean, w- one other thing that I, I found interesting about I, I actually uh, there there is like a on um, there's a link that shares certain fights outside of Tachi Palace. I actually watched. Uh, the other day, you're one against, uh, I believe, Cody Gibson. Um, oh yeah, uh, he was big. Yeah, I mean, you look like he had you oversized, but that that was a bantamweight fight, was it not? Yeah, I went up. See, the, after I had I had held the belt for 125 at Taji Palace, mm-hmm. and then Daryl Monty who beat me, and then he ended up losing the belt to to Ian. But uh, after Daryl beat me, I wanted I was. I was like, all right, I, I was going to go. I was going to stay at 125s, and then they offered me a fight at uh, at 125 against this guy named Drew Bittner. So then, like, maybe, like, halfway into camp, they called me. They go, hey, they go, well, he can't make 125. He wants to do it at 130. I'm like, all right, cool, whatever. And then maybe, like, two or three weeks before the fight, they go, hey, they go, he can't make 130. We want to do it at 135. I'm like, oh, that's cool, fine. So we fought at 135 to so go back down to 125 because I feel that's the where I, I have the, 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 the most advantage. Mm-hmm. And then um, I forgot who Cody was supposed to fight, but his opponent pulled down. They go, hey, man, they go, we need you to fight for the belt at 135. And I go, well, I was only planning on fighting at 125. They go, well, we, you know, we really need you to do it. You know, we don't have a main event, this and that. So I stepped up. Wow. Well, that's a cool story. I didn't even know. Not, I'm sure not many know that. That's a cool story, though. When you came in on, on how, how was there like a certain amount of notice? Was it short notice? No, I had a full camp for it. But oh. my, my originally, like, I was supposed to fight at 125 against someone else. And they were like, hey, um, you know, we don't have a main, we don't have a, a guy to fight Cody for the belt. And we need someone. And you're the former, you know, 125 pound champion. Can you fight him for the belt 35s? 
And I was like, well, I didn't really want to. I wanted to because I was like, well, I can be the first 125 and 135 pound champion. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's just like, I was like, ah, you know, I know my place is at 125. Yeah, I mean, that's cool to have, they have both belts. I mean, it shows that you're very, like, even, like, certain guys' size don't matter. And I was impressed, uh, I'm impressed just hearing that. That's a cool story. But w where do you feel you'll compete moving forward? 125, right? Well, all my losses are 125, and I've had three or four fights at 135 that I've never lost. Mm -hmm. Not saying that, uh, well, the thing with 125 is sometimes if I don't stick to my diet, which I tend to do, not sometimes, that cut makes it difficult. So a lot of the times the cut affects my performance. Like when I fought Ron Basamdin. Other times, um, because 125 has so many less fighters, let's say there's 30, 40 fighters on 125 in the world, you know, you're going to fight a top 10 guy like every other fight, you know, and I fought three, you know, three guys in the top five, you know. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's harder, in my opinion, at 125 is because there's less guys. And like at 70s, there's so many 170 pounds, you could be like, you know, get a good record, be 12, 13 and 0 and not really fight anybody. Yeah, I got you. Well, I'm more excited to see at 125, but I'd also like to see, you know, uh, be able to... Um, Get get down, uh, get get some wins in, and then f find yourself on that Mexico card. I might actually love to attend it, you know, because I, I visit Mexico every now and again. I have family, or I mean, uh, my girlfriend has family down there. I visited twice. It's pretty. It's nice out there. Um, yeah, it's super cool up there. Mm -hmm. Another question I have for you is just uh, as far as your your, your grappling career, do, do you uh, like how do you prepare for that? Um, well, you know, the thing is like. Um, as far as grappling, at first, I, when I would, I, one year I did 17 grappling tournaments. So mm -hmm. I would like grapple like every other week at a tournament, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, I felt like I got really, really good doing that just because you're going out there competing against somebody you don't, don't know. So it forced you to bring your A game. Then when I started fighting, I didn't feel like, I didn't want to get nervous for grappling. So like right now, like even I have the Eddie Bravo thing, I'm like, well, I'm just going to gonna grapple and just run. You know, I'm not doing strength and conditioning like um, like I would do for, for a fight, you know, because it's just grappling. So I'm not as nervous as as I feel like I would be for a fight. But um, I will say this. I did the super fight against uh, Chris Womanzi at the UFC Fat Expo last year. And I wasn't nervous mm -hmm. all day. But I remember right before I got, right when they announced my name to get on the mat, I just felt like I was like, oh, crap. Like, it just hit me all of a sudden. I don't know why. Uh -huh. Probably because I needed to learn is that like like a nerve dump right there? Is that was that what you describe it as? You know what it was is because um, I had those two fights in the UFC that I lost. Um, then I was doing something for the UFC because it was the Fat Expo, and I was like, man, I was just like, I and I'm supposed to be a grappler, and I'm going against another grappler. Like I can't lose, you know, in a grappling match is what I'm supposed to be good at. So I just all of a sudden I just felt super nervous. Like literally right before I walked on the mat, I was like, oh man, I, said, I don't know, it was just weird. Yeah, uh, what was his name? Romina Sato. That sounds familiar. Is yeah, that... Romina Sato. Uh, that was two years ago when I went against Romina. Uh, Romina Sato, he fought like Carl Uno, John Lewis. He oh, has so a six second uh, flying arm bar against uh, He's Charlie. a bigger guy, correct? Isn't he like a. Uh, what is it? Is he a lightweight? Or is he. He fought at 45s, 55s, and I oh, think. Wow. I don't know if he fought at 70s, but he fought at 45s and 55s. Wow. So he you know, competed yeah, against. Yeah, he was like one of my idols growing up, but that dude. Oh, that's cool. Uh, that that ended up. Uh, I remember Chris was at that expo. He, I remember him telling us that he watched that competition. Um, what is it? Me, he was both at both the twenty twelve and twenty thirteen. I was only at the twenty twelve one. Okay. Yeah, I went against Ruben. I think twenty eleven or twenty twelve. Oh, and then yeah. last year I went against Woodmanzi. So I lost the one against Ruben, uh, and I and I won the one against Woodmanzi. Wow. That's 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 a. Man, I'm like starting. I'm actually looking at, at, at your, your page on Sherdog now, and you've gotten all these championships and awards uh, under grappling, which is pretty dope. <laughs> I gotta say, what, what would you say is your uh, favorite competition in, in jiu-jitsu that you've competed in? Uh, well, um, rules wise, or like the favorite one that won? Well, actually, what rule set do you favor going into a, a jiu-jitsu tournament? I, I liked, I did the Gracian Nationals, and it was a 30-minute time limit. Oh, wow. Or, or win by submission or win by 12. And uh, I like those rules, but I didn't like that. I got kind of screwed out of some points in the finals, but I still won. 
I don't like those rules. As far as like, um, just because it's 30 minutes, you know, you're like, oh, cool, you know, let's see, you know, what people are made of. But probably the most, and it's going to sound kind of kind of lame, but the most, the the happiest I've ever been winning a, winning a, a, a medal or first place was Grappler's Quest. Because I did it like four years in a row and I always took second or I took third and I never won it. Then when I finally won it, I was like, finally. <laughs> oh, man. Redemption. Yeah. So t- uh, tell me about what you think about uh, a certain landscape of the UFC. You got, uh, like, how, how do you think it's looking right now? It's been a weird year, for me at least I feel, for uh, MMA in general with Bellator uh, kind of having questionable calls, the UFC kind of having questionable calls as far as matchmaking. What do, you, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I think, uh, in my opinion, the best rules ever are the, the pride rules. Um, pride rules? Is, is that what you said? Yeah, they, they favor more more action. Like, okay, there's no needs to a down opponent. I mean, mm-hmm. sorry, you, sorry you, you can be a down opponent unless there was that, you know, if, if, you, know, if you weigh over 20 pounds, you know, it's up to whatever. But uh, if if I fight less, yeah, and uh, um, Bill Harris again. Uh, one second, Ulysses, you're kind of cutting out. So you can't take lazy shots. Yeah. If I take him down or he takes me down, you can't elbow, so it forces you to pass the guard. Like you just can't sit there and elbow people and, and grind them out and take time. It forces you to press the action. So I really like those rules. I never really like the 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 rings as much, but um. I felt like those were more better rules um, for the fight fans. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> a lot of our admins are going to be happy to hear that one. They're big Pride fans, and they love those rule sets. My my biggest beef as far as rule sets with the uh, with uh, fighting is I don't like that, you know, hands down, and then you can't get knee in the face kind of rule. Um, right, right. The, yeah, the three point, the, yeah, the, I mean, granted, you don't have to fight, so I'm not complaining. Ha <laughs> ha, yeah. I've never had to uh, go for it, but um, I mean, if it happened to me, I, I guess, uh, or if I was in the same kind of boat, I guess I wouldn't complain either. Um, but as a fan, I guess watching that's kind of the only beef you have. Yeah, I mean, I, I, like I, I really thought Pride had the best rules because it favors, you could say favors a striker more than a grappler on the feet, but it also favors a person that's trying to pass the guard and look for the submission. I just kind of sit there and ground a pound, you know. Yeah, not like your your, your average guy. He just sits in the guard, lays on top of you, and right. Yeah, I hear you. As far as um, who's your favorite fighter in the UFC right now? That's a question from John Geller. Man, probably my all-time favorite fighter is BJ Penn. For real? Yeah, nice. Yeah, yeah, and it's funny because BJ is like, all right, man, he's the only guy, probably the only guy you could ever think of that. Has the title had the title one fifty five and one seventies. He was the Abu Dhabi. Or he was the Mundial champion, first ever American to do it. He probably would have been the Abu Dhabi champion if he ever did Abu Dhabi. We had all these accolades, and you're like, man, but he could have done more. Like that's the scary part is that like for as for as accomplished he is in the UFC and MMA, you're like, man, but he could have done more. Mm-hmm. Like if I would have been the UFC champion once, not even twice, I would die a happy man. He did it twice, and you're like, man, but he could have did more. You know what I mean? Yeah. My, one of my favorite BJ moments is when he, uh, what was it? When he, because one of the first early fights I ever watched was BJ Penn versus uh, Matt Hughes. That's what oh, that was the hooked. fight. The first one, right? Yeah, the very first one. And then the second one, uh, his, my favorite moment is when he de- uh, defeated Sean Shirk. Uh, I was watching that live as a little kid, and I was just like, oh, you know. That I mean, he he could he was like pristine, uh, you know, prime BJ at the time, right there. And uh, man, yeah, how do you think? How do you see him doing against Frankie Edgar? I'm really like I'm really debated on that. I really am, just because Frankie doesn't look as good as he used to. But you know, and you don't know how BJ will look at 145. Yeah, people realize don't realize like yeah, it's 10 pounds, but 10 pounds is a lot when you're a smaller guy, and it's also a lot if you're already sucked up and dehydrated. Exactly, but that's debatable you know? only because BJ, as a as a one seventy pounder, never looked like he was losing too much weight. Right. Matter of fact, he would weigh in sometimes at like one sixty eight or like he weighed well, in that for the John Fish Dolce, fight. So that's good. He does what? He's worked with Mike Dolce, so that's good. Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah. The one. thing with BJ at seventies is he never had to do cardio. He could because he didn't have to make weight. 
Mm-hmm. At 55, he would have to do cardio to make weight. So maybe at 45, he'll have a better gas tank because he has to train harder, or he might not have a gas tank because he left it all on, on the scale. Yeah. Who knows, you know? Yeah, you also got to factor in that if he's got Mike Dolce, he's also changing his diet around. Uh, I don't know how his diet would have been fighting at 155, but Mike Dolce puts you like on a set diet. He's a nutritionist as well. And uh, that's that's one of the bigger things about him is that he, he puts you on like certain diets that still help with protein and uh, and, and help you lose fat and, and distributes your weight really well. He's got like his own kind of master regimen that's that's uh, that if BJ's on it definitely benefits him. He's also back training with Andre Pedneres and is training with yeah. you know, at Nova Nobanyao. So that like I mean it just seems like BJ's doing all the right things and and you don't hear much of what Frankie's doing other than the, the same old same old what he's doing. It you know uh and he's looked so and so I mean at featherweight but I mean that's kind of early to tell only because you know you look at him and he's only had two fights, one against the champ and then one against Charles Oliveira. Um I don't know. I'm, I'm still torn. Who do, you, who do you got for that fight? As, as far I mean, as I'm like, a diehard BJ fan, so can't can't got the bias. <laughs> I, yeah, I always got to go. I mean, you know, because when I first started training with Mark Lehman, we were uh, under you were at JSEC, and that was you know Novi Yuel, you know. So and he was the first American to win, to win the Mundial as a black belt. Then he's in the UFC knocking people out. You're like, man, this guy's you know yeah. he's the truth, you know. Yep, dude does it all. Who who would you say? Uh, oh, you said you didn't uh, see the one seventy two uh, pay per view, but it, it's a question that all kinds of fans keep asking about. But pound for pound, who do you think is the best in the world right now? I mean, the pound, the pound for pound is always debatable because it's like, well, exactly. Okay, John Jones technically has a loss, but he really lose to Matt Hamill. No, mm-hmm. and then Kevin Velasquez has a loss because he got knocked out, but he wiped that knockout clean by. Pretty much beating up Junior Dos Santos. Brawl has a loss, but then like, look what he's done since then. So it's always like, I would say, you, I mean, if they all fought, I would obviously say, you know, probably Kane would be all three of them. Mm-hmm. It was Brawl, John Jones, you know. And uh, but then it's like, it's hard, man. I yeah. mean, it's it's one of those things that it just, it's cool to talk about, but it doesn't really mean much. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Austin Mayer asked, my question to him would be, what is the biggest highlight moment? I've already asked you that. Jeez, i got to go over these better. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, t- tell me about where you train, Cobra Kai Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, I train at Cobra Kai Jiu-Jitsu with Simcoe. He's the head instructor over there, and I do all my boxing with Gil Martinez. Oh, and really? Stri- yeah, and I do all my strength conditioning with the- this guy named Sean Spees. So uh, I have a pretty good team around me, you know. Uh, the hard part... For being a smaller guy and getting, you know, small guys to train with you. I used to always be the guy that would... I realized in my career that um, people always say, you know, if you want to go spar with bigger guys because, you know, they're going to hit harder and they're they're going to be stronger than the guy you fight. And that's good if you're a 170-pounder, 185-pounder sparring bigger guys, you know. But at 125, strength's never an issue for us. It's always speed. So if I'm sparring with bigger guys, I'm not used to see, going with fast guys. Like when I fought Ramba, that it was so fast, I wasn't used to that. Like it, that messed me up. When you fought who? Ramba Samadit. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So like. Um, I didn't I realize you fought like, him, but uh, looking at your list here, I see that you have. Yeah, I fought him. I probably shouldn't have fought him when I did, but they needed someone to fight him, so I was like, you know, you get. I believe my own hype. I was like, oh, I'll just take him down and submit him. And then when I took him down, I didn't submit him. <laughs> but uh yeah so i mean just i i prefer to spar with smaller guys now so that's one of the hard things though is getting guys that you could they that can you could spar with that have the skill set but that would push you but not break you because you know if you're, this is your second third workout of the day you're exhausted and you, you're cutting weight and this and that and the guy wants to prove a point because his girlfriend's watching that's not going to do any good you know mm-hmm I have a I have a question. I don't know if you've been paying attention to the page lately, but I've been doing I've been posting up these these the tournaments. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, now I'm doing a submission grappling one, and who better That's to all. ask than a than an expert like you? Uh, what do you think? Uh, how how it looks? Uh, what do you think about it? Looking at like the first round of guys that I put up thus far. It's like day three right now. What um, you have on it? Well, today's matchup, uh, which tomorrow's will be a different one, because this is like a pre-recorded kind of podcast we do. It goes up the next day. 
Um, mm -hmm. But to, uh, today's was Genki Sudo versus John Jones, and uh, looks like Sudo's winning, and fairly so to me. That dude did some did some wacky stuff as a as an artist uh, on the ground back in the day. He's he's uh, one of those famous flying armbar armbar triangle kind of dudes. Yeah. You know what I mean? Uh, yesterday we had Paulo Filo and Uriah Faber, and then the first day was Henzo Gracie versus Minotaro and Nogueira. Uh, so I'd say Minotaro, Faber, and then probably Genki. Yeah, and then t uh, tomorrow's, which is today's, Damian Maya and uh, Frank Shamrock. Uh, well, I think Damian is more of an accomplished grappler, mm -hmm. but um, Frank probably applied it better because nobody really knew Jiu Jitsu back then. Yeah, um, but Damon also had that that point in his career where he thought he was a striker. Yeah, like against uh, what was it? Well, not I wouldn't say name Mark. It was too early to tell. It was only twenty seconds in. He got knocked out. If you remember at EOC yeah. one one hundred and two, I believe. Um, and then uh, what is it? Yeah, he tried striking with Mark Munoz. But if you watch that fight, he actually caught Mark a few times. But yeah, I mean, he kind of got away from his bread and butter for a few fights and. Uh, then he's lost. fighting at 185, not 170s, you know. Yeah, I'm excited that he's at 170. I believe that he's he's the bigger guy. He's not as you know carrying as much weight. He actually looks good. I think it's it's good that he's down there. He's uh who's he fighting next? I know he has a fight schedule. I can't remember off the top of my head, not without looking. Um, but yeah, and then the next day will be Jacare Souza Husamar Pajares, which is an insane first round matchup. I think like I mean. Yeah, I, w I would say, like, if they wrestled, I would go Jacare nine times out of ten. I think Jacare is a better fighter just because, not, I mean, I like Paul Harris. I love him. He like, you know, his leg locks, but he's, sometimes he's, he shows up, sometimes he doesn't. Yeah, Jacare always shows up. He doesn't mess around. As far as I understand, he's never been finished, I don't believe. Um, Husamar, yeah. Plus, I don't think his striking's all too there, too. I think overall, Jacare's striking game is, is more clean, more, more polished than Husamar's is. Um, and then uh, another first round sick matchup is Frank Mir and Fedor Emelianenko. Ah uh, man, yeah, that's tough. Yeah, all right. I've trained Frank a couple times. Huh? I've trained with Frank a couple times. Yeah, how good is like how good is it to train with somebody like that? Someone who's so big, but he knows his he knows his shit on the ground. You know what I mean? Frank's real good. Yeah. Um, so. strong. Rico Rodriguez is way better, in my opinion. Say that again? You kind of cut off. Rico, Rico was way better than my opinion. Yeah, he's in here. Uh, who's he against? Oh, he was in here, and then Adam decided to take him off for... I mean, if you look at credential-wise, Abu Dhabi, every time he did Abu Dhabi, he plays. He plays first, third, fourth, second, something like that. Um, yeah. He was the UFC champion. He in the case champion, arguably the number one contender in Pride. He arguably beat Minotaro. Like, he has one of the best resumes, but now it's kind of like, you know, downhill. Yeah, also, I uh, forgot to mention, yeah, he was in it, and then we took him out, and then we put him back in for Ken Shamrock's spot against Matt Hughes. So, him and Matt Hughes. <laughs> oh, he, he, he have his way with Matt Hughes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you look at... Uh, my criteria is so, like... Uh, so by like hypocritical towards itself because here's the rule set like i'll read it out loud it's like you know vote simply by writing the fighter it's based on the skills as a submission expert or grappler throughout their career not based on like other skill sets in mma um what was it and it should be based on the grappling ability when stacked against each other and uh so and then the last rule set will explain to you why it's so hypocritical and in it's into itself because it's who did the best sub grappling work in the history of their career um, I'll leave it to your discretion to value offense and defense, how you account for time period, influence with that style, and uh, and how and and so it's like you could think of it in many ways, like how they would do if they just grappled with each other, or how you look at how they performed against others throughout their career um, when they grappled and how good they did with it. And um, Rico Rodriguez has had a hell of a career, and I, I, if I'm not mistaken, he still fights, kind of. I don't know. Uh, I know yeah, he fought uh, Fedor recently. He's hit the best, man. I don't know. I know he's. I think he's on a losing streak right now. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I remember he fought Fedor about the year 
uh, before he retired or the year that he did retire, I forget. I think it was his last fight, correct? Uh, I don't He, I think he lost two career bro. Yeah. For Rico, you mean? Yeah. That's what. Because now I'm curious. I don't even know. He actually won his last fight, which is last December, against uh, some guy named Nostoras uh, Basilas. I don't know if I said that right. I might have butchered it, but he's actually got one win, and then prior to that, a no contest, and then he has another win. That's weird. Yeah. Hmm. Could have sworn he fought Fedor, didn't he? Maybe I'm thinking no. somebody else. He fought. He lost Freeman. He never fought Fedor. He fought. Uh, uh, what did he fight? Who did Fedor Bigfoot. fight? I'm having like the weirdest fucking. What is it called? Yeah, I'm. I oh, just... he fought Glover Teixeira. He fought who? Glover Teixeira. He fought Glover Teixeira. Really? Yeah, that's what I saw right now. Wow. Two thousand and seven. I'm sorry, 2011. I'm assuming he lost. <laughs> yeah, by uh, punches. Each. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I know you didn't watch the fight, but uh, just my overall opinion on that was, man, Glover just could not get on that inside. Uh, it was basically your quintessential Jones performance where he was using his reach to, to a T. He was using his, uh, his hands really well, especially, um, as well as his kicks, but he was, he was using, like, utilizing his hands more often. Than... Pedro Hizzo, that's who it is. Yeah, he got knocked out by Hizzo. Yeah, and and that's who I thought that uh, f that's the guy who fought Fedor last. I was trying to remember. I I don't know how I mixed those two up, but uh, but yeah, Rico is a a real deal. And I, as far as with Matt Hughes, that's hard only because um, you take into account Matt Hughes's wrestling. That's how that's m more so what he uses, kind of, so, somewhat like uh, Uriah Faber, who used more so wrestling to get his submissions in as opposed to uh, jujitsu training. Um, early on in his career, at least. So, but I find that one hard. And then, uh, okay, you're biased here, but Carlos Newton and BJ Penn. <laughs> oh, BJ. BJ. Even I gotta say BJ, I think. that yeah. That's a fight that could have happened at one point or another, too. Say yeah, it could have. Yeah, it could have. Uh, and then Boss Rutten versus Anato Babalusa Brawl. Boss. Okay, I can't go wrong with Boss. Here's a good one. Uh, Hicks and Gracie versus uh, Masakasu Funaki. Well, I mean, well, um, if you're going off legend, I say Hickson. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think I think even Hickson over Funaki just because uh, he's fought tougher guys. But I mean, I don't think Hickson would get very far if he was going off like their MMA performances because go to fight, you know. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, he fought like the really Pride fights, and he kind of helped set up Pride and to a degree where they were just kind of feeding him dudes. So it's hard to go off his career. Yeah. Uh, he's a big influence though, and which is another criteria you can use if you want to vote for him. Which is why it's like there's there's really there's really no wrong way of voting for whoever you're voting for unless you just rather preference one thing about a fighter as far as influence, style, or or technique over the other. You know what I mean? Uh, Shinya Yoki versus Nate Diaz. Ooh, I think I probably sh uh, say Shinya. Shinya, yeah, just slightly. Just, I mean, Shinya has just been a savage on the ground for years now. I mean, Nate Diaz is is very good and decent, especially. Um, sometimes he just has a hard time with with wrestlers, especially, and so it's kind of. And, and Shinya has fought some wrestlers and been able to finish them. So just based off that, I kind of want to lean towards him. Kazusi uh, Sakuraba versus Ronda Rousey. <laughs> I mean, I'm gonna say Sakuraba, but I'm pretty sure everybody else gonna say Ronda. You'd be surprised. A lot of people. Chris will do whatever he whatever he has to because his favorite fighter is Sakuraba, and his least favorite fighter is Ronda. He'll do whatever he has to to sway the vote. <laughs> it also has nothing to do with uh, Sakuraba being Asian. Yeah, <laughs> maybe I don't know, man. Chris is a Chris has been a huge fan since I've known him. Of Sakuraba talks about him constantly and and stuff. So maybe I don't know. <laughs> Nick Diaz and Josh Barnett. Ugh, it's a tough one. I say Barnett. He's pretty tough, man. He's a good catch wrestler. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and plus, uh, like, how much how often does he how often does Diaz use use his grappling in a fight? Well, lately, yeah. I mean, early on, he used it pretty well. Nate Diaz used it better. I feel. 
Yeah. Yeah, so I'd probably go with Barnett just based off that. This is a very... I didn't even want to put Hoist in there because he was using it at a time where no one used Jiu-Jitsu too often. But mm -hmm. he's in it. And uh, you got him put up against uh, Jake Shields. I think, I mean, I, I think Damon Wyatt's a, a better version of Hoist. And you saw what Jake Shields did on. Yeah. Enough said on that one. Megumi Fuji. I'm, I always feel like I'm butchering her name. But uh, Megumi Fuji and Travis Fulton, the man who holds the most records for submissions in a career. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I mean, if, if they fought, probably him, but I would say her because she's probably a lot more. You should have Jeremy Horn in there. I wanted to put him in there. Adam wanted to put him in there, but all the rest of the admins were like, no, nah, no, I don't do it. Probably should have put him in for one of the Diaz brothers. Or... I would have put Jeremy Horn in there instead of Travis Fulton. Yeah? Yeah. I believe they competed at one point or another, right? Travis fought everybody. I'm sure. I mean,. He has like over 300 fights, if you can believe that. Let's see. Kind of going to look it up. But he has like over 100, 200 submissions to his uh, career. I mean, I'm sure a lot of them are against people who are just trying MMA out or something. But Right. Yeah. He's been in there with, man, he's been in there with a lot of big guys, too, like Ben Rothwell. Yeah, he fought Jeremy Horn in 2003. Lost him by TKO. So, that's... Yeah, I'm thinking about putting, I mean, like, because uh, if the matchups haven't happened yet, I might put somebody in, because I, I decided, we decided to put uh, Rico Rodriguez in for Ken Shamrock after we had already announced the matchup, so I don't mind changing it up. Uh, we might put uh, him in for, I wanted to put him in for Babalu, but, uh, and also one of the Diaz brothers, might end up putting him in there for Nick, I don't know, but. I mean, you could have always put, like. Okay, well, the, the best grappler in the world is Hodge Gracie or Drysdale. Well, wow, they both fought MMA. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's always, I guess it's always subjective. Yeah. Does Jeremy still fight? I don't believe he does anymore, does he? Does who? Jeremy? No, I don't think so. I think he's retired. Let's look. I'm mm -hmm. curious. He, nope, fought just this month, it was last month. Oh, wow. Uh, got his 90th win against a guy named Dan McGlayson on April 6th uh, at a unknown promotion. It just says APFC. So. Hmm. But he won by rear naked choke. He's on a three-fight win streak, believe it or not. He actually uh, lost to Talos Ladies three years ago. That was his last loss. Wow, he's 90 and 21 with how many submissions? 61 submissions. Damn. Not bad. I feel, by, I feel like I should put him in there now. Uh <laughs> Might, might put him in there. I'll definitely take that into consideration and talk with it about the admins because any matchups that haven't happened yet are subject to change. So, other than that, what do you think about this tournament? And who do you think probably wins uh, beyond everybody else? Mind you, the fans of the page are very unpredictable. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like, uh, it's hard because it all depends on what the cr criteria are, you know, and if they're going off, if they're voting off skill set or if they're going off being a fanboy. Yeah, I mean, I I put it in there too. It's like this isn't a this isn't a popularity contest. Don't you know? I mean, some people admit it. Like, I love this guy, but I got to go for the other guy. Some people write that. And yeah, I appreciate that. If 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 the if that's if because they're being sincere, whether it's right or not, they're at least being sincere with their vote, which I appreciate to any to all the fans listening. Um, but yeah, I mean, for anybody listening, don't base don't vote based on being a fan. Don't do that because <laughs> that's not what it's about. And uh, a lot of people feel that way about the wrestling tournament that I did, that GSP won. You know, yeah. uh, and a lot of people felt that Cheo made his way through it just based off you know fan popularity, which is debatable. But he is a good wrestler, so it's kind of questionable in, in, in itself. And, uh, and I whoa. and I don't like that you know people feel like um, they need to vote based on that, especially when I lay it out. Don't vote based on popularity. Uh, so we'll see. I mean, our, our fans tend to not listen to us, so we'll see, <laughs> we'll see how that goes. Um, I would say, all, at starting this off, I I thought when when we when I had come up with the concept of a submission grappler tournament, I thought maybe Fedor would be the favorite, and then you put him in there against Frank Mir, and then I'm like, whoa, hmm. And then he could possibly face Hickson. He could possibly face Aoki. He's got a tough. Perdome. Uh, well, Verdum's on the other side of the bracket, but he could meet him in the finals, which, if he did, Verdum's got some bragging rights. You know what I mean? Right. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, looking at it, I actually like it. And I randomized it. I had no, no uh, say in how the matchups looked at all. I randomized the whole thing. So uh, I actually feel bad about putting John Jones in there. I should have maybe put somebody in there for him. But only based on who he submitted is kind of why he's in there. Um, but I, I, I appreciate hearing uh, your, your thoughts about it. Um, any last words you want to get in? Because I know you got work to go and stuff to do and spinning out. I got to I got to train for the Eddie Bravo thing. Yeah, Guys, some people to choke. <laughs> give us your uh, give us uh, what what are your favorite submissions? I actually wanted to ask that at the beginning. Uh, probably rear naked, rear naked choke. Reason being, if you get someone, if you get their arm or you get their leg, you can break it. They can still fight. But if you get their neck and you put them to sleep, they can't. Yeah, exactly. Um, what what uh, my favorite submission that I've ever landed. In a, in a matchup and nobody believes me but because I, I practiced the open guard for a long time I did a, I did a uh, jiu jitsu tournament in 2011 and was able to and I was a blue belt at the time but I was still practicing the, the rubber guard um, and I was able to get a go-go plot on somebody uh, oh nice yeah it was like this that was as a, as a grappler that's like my highest moment when I was able to land that um, and I don't think you saw it coming I'm a plata, so he tries protecting his arm you know what I mean? And it just left his neck more open. Um, and so I went for the go-go. And I actually, uh, I, I could have gone for the omoplata because he wasn't defending correctly, but I saw his neck open just enough for me to get my shin across. And um, and that's my favorite submission that I've ever landed. And so anybody else? I did, that, uh, I did that in a fight. Really? I, I fired Drew Bittner and I got him in the omoplata and I went for the go-go plata. And uh, instead of being on my hip, I was flat on my back. And I was like, well, I'm just going to squeeze. You just keep on squeezing. And hopefully he was happy, you know? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to reposition because if I reposition, he might get out. So I was just squeezing and squeezing. And I popped my own knee. You pop your own Ugh. Yeah, I popped my own knee. Worst thing about that tournament, though, I, that exact one that I'm talking about, I actually got injured because I, uh, I, I made it to the finals and then I lost my knee bar and the guy just bummed my knee really badly, yeah. which sucks. And then another tournament later, I ended up breaking my hand. Because I took the guy down, and his hip bone landed right in the center of my hand, right here. Oh. And uh, you probably can't see it, but I got, like, the scar where the bone kind of was pushing out. And they had to cut through and fix it and everything. And, yeah, I mean, be careful. Jiu-Jitsu obviously can fuck you up still. So, yeah. But uh, go ahead and plug us in. When is it going to be? Uh, who else is competing, if you know of anyone? It's uh, June 1st, I think, in Long Beach. Oh, uh, really? You're going to be out here? Yeah, Long Beach or Hollywood? I'm not. Actually, you know what? I'll tell you right now. Hang on. I have it on my phone. If it's gonna be out here, I'd love to come and see and watch, man. Yeah, I don't know who who else is in it. Um, it doesn't really matter because I'm gonna beat them all. <laughs> but um, let me see if I can find it. I just had it. It's on my Facebook. Oh yeah, you posted it on your Facebook. That's where I saw it first. It's uh, Florentine Gardens in Hollywood. Florentine Gardens in Hollywood, man. Hook yeah, me up with tickets, bro. <laughs> yeah, but if I could, I would. I, yeah. I mean, I'm still trying to figure out like all the you know, all the time and who's in it, but we'll, well see. It'll be fun. Yeah, I'll de whether or not you can, I'll definitely come down. I'd love to watch. Uh, I enjoy going to competitions. I actually was going to go to the uh, one that Nick Diaz was going to compete at, the one that he no-showed. Oh, yeah, the, uh, um, you know, the World, World Expo or whatever. Yeah, the one that was going to be on Internet Pay-Per-View. Yeah. Uh, and then when I heard he wasn't going, I went anyway, but I left like early just because uh, um, certain matchups just weren't as exciting for me. Um, That's the one that had uh, um, Jeff Glover and uh, Kyle Terra, right? Mm hmm. Kyle Terra is a beast. I do, uh, Yeah. Yeah. He just talks funny. <laughs> yeah. He's got a funny voice and everything. Because uh, I talked to him in the back for a split second because he was actually talking to to, to my jujitsu uh, coach who was there cornering somebody. Um, but they're always fun, and I and it's a month away, so good luck to you in your training, and uh, hopefully if I can, uh, I'll try and make it definitely and watch it, and hopefully uh, I can meet up and be cool to meet you. Uh, and I'll be rooting for you, brother. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate having you on, MMA fans. Uh, thanks for for being the first guest. I appreciate that so much, especially. And uh, you've been. This has been a great interview. I appreciate you a lot, man. Only time, man. I appreciate it. MMA fans, if you have any comments, uh, quotes, anything you want to say, please leave a comment. Ulysses, thank you so much, man. Sounds good, Mike. You have a good one. Good luck training, bro. Talk to you soon. Thanks, buddy. Later. Late.